who has joined us here at Second and Third Royal Friend Presbyterian Church for our Sunday morning service. You're very welcome. Uh, today we have a number of people taking part in our service. So uh, Lisa Weir will re uh, lead us in prayer a little bit later on. Brian Appleton will read from the scripture. And the praise will be led by a number of our young people from our church, the praise band. And as always, there'll be a time to talk to the children. So I trust you'll be blessed by that. Sunday school has already happened each Sunday morning from 10.30 a.m. on Facebook. We, it, it, it goes out live. And we also have our weekday devotion on the Psalms on Facebook and YouTube that you can tune into if that is a help to you throughout the week. Not everybody has the internet though. We have some people who just have not got internet service. So we record the service on to DVD and CD and if you would like one or you know someone who would like one, then the number will be on the screen. Get in touch with us and we will get that to you uh, for that. We're continuing to meet Wednesday by Wednesday for prayer. It's important that our church meets for prayer. So we're doing that by Zoom. So if you'd like to join us for that, but you haven't got the codes for it, the codes are sent out by WhatsApp each week. Uh, so again, give us a ring and I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you the code for that. And also, can I say that if we as a church can help you, uh, either practically or spiritually, then please get in touch uh, with us. Uh, and again, my number will be up on the screen. Thinking upon the message this week, uh, my mind went to Psalm 40 verses 1 to 3. Uh, that wee passage talks about how God delivers those who call upon his name. Let me read it to you. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet upon a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see it and fear and trust the Lord. What a wonderful uh, words of encouragement to cry out to the Lord. So let's sing our first hymn. It's a Getty piece. By faith we see the hand of God.
we come to prayer, Lisa is going to lead us in prayer. Let's pray. Let us pray. Dear God, thank you for your amazing power and work in our lives. Thank you for your goodness and blessing over us. Thank you for your great love and care. Forgive us for when we don't take time to thank you for who you are and for all you do for each one of us. Help us to set our eyes and our hearts on you and fill us with your peace and joy. Remember all those who are shielding at home. Give them comfort and assurance of better days ahead where they can meet up with family and friends. Be near to those who are sick at this time and let them feel your loving arms around them. Also remember those who have been bereaved in recent days. Let them know we are praying for them and thinking about them. Give our key workers strength for each new day and keep them safe and virus free. As we continue in our service, be with Seamus as he ministers to us. We give you praise and thanks for you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, Amen. Right, boys and girls, uh, no birthdays this week. Might have one or two the following week. Today's sermon is about a blind man who was enabled to see Jesus. His name was Bartimaeus. I think everybody probably called him Blind Bartimaeus because it has a kind of ring to it. Anyway, so today we're thinking about seeing and not seeing, blindness and sight, all those sorts of things. And actually that's very topical for me because this week I'm not seeing very well. These are, these are my old glasses. And I've had to wear my old glasses because a lens popped out of my new glasses. I'll just show you them here. I was wearing them earlier in the week and I had them on my head and walking along and look, a lens went and so I'm not seeing very well. So blind Bartimaeus is very topical for me. Earlier in the week, I sent you out a question about seeing. What has eyes but cannot see was the question I asked. And I got loads and loads of answers. And not just from children either. William Shelley and Andrew Bell were straight in there. But I'm just going to ignore their answers because they're not children. So Elliot Hutchinson, Elliot Hutchinson said a potato. So yes, Elliot, potatoes have eyes but cannot see. I've got a potato right here. So look, I think, I think that's the eye. I'm not sure. Um, Jack Hutchinson, oh sorry, Jack Hanna said a needle. And I have a needle here. Let's see if you can see that. There we go. Can you see that? That's a needle. It's got an eye, but obviously it cannot see. What else? Amy Moorhead said moles. Very clever, Amy. I never thought of that one. So well done to you. Lucy Laffin and Ruby Hanna said a newborn kitten. Ellie Laffin, Sam Gibson and Caleb Hanna. I think you were all ringing each other as soon as I sent this question out. They said a blind person. So well done there as well. A blind people often have eyes, but obviously they cannot see. What else? Uh, Lucy Johnson said a teddy bear. Katie and Lucy Bell also said a teddy bear and dolls and animals on your clothes. Rachel Graham, let's see if you can work this one out. Rachel Graham said the word activities, which is very clever and took me a long time to work out. So yeah, well done. Well done, Rachel. Activities, got eyes in it, but cannot see. So I thought of road markings cat's eyes and I think Gus Parry sent that one in as well he's not a child uh, so cat's eyes Lois Graham said a storm the eye of a storm ever heard of that one well here it is so if you can see just right there in the middle there is this kind of circle that's called the eye of the storm and that's the center part of a storm it's got an eye it cannot see so well done to all of you for those. What about something that has no eyes, but somehow can see? I didn't ask you this question, but what about, can, is it possible for something that has not got any eyes, but can see? Yes, that is possible. There is a red 
brittle starfish you have it on your screen called let's see if i can pronounce this an ophicoma wendetti uh, i'm told it's a cousin of the sea star and sea cucumber and somehow this little creature is able to see without eyes one of god's strange little creatures and it can dance as well let me introduce you to someone else who is blind and yet can see. This is her story. I've been blind since birth. I have a disease called Leber's congenital amaurosis. People often ask me, you know, is it hard being blind? Is it scary? And it's not. There was a time in my life when I was angry about being blind. I was very into makeup and trying to look my best. I really wanted to look in the mirror and see what I look like, but I couldn't. The Lord spoke to me and he told me that I am beautiful on the inside and that I don't have to worry about what I look like on the outside and that he is the only one who can tell me what I look like. The mirror can't. Sometimes I feel like I'm a little bit of a burden to people. See you back in front of you, girl. Sometimes I wish I didn't really need that much help. I wish that I didn't have to rely on them. Okay, got everything with? Yep. All right, we're out the front door this time. I'll break too. <laughs> if I could see, I don't think my faith would be as strong. Because for a blind person, you have to rely on the Lord. It's like your faith becomes more real because you're used to not seeing things. You're used to believing in someone that you can't see. Like for example, my mom, I can't see her. I may be able to hear her, but even if I couldn't, I can't see her, but I know she's there. So for me, I think it's easier to know and to understand that though I can't see God, He's really there. I think it has a lot to do with walking by faith and not by sight. I have this desire to help people, but I feel like being blind sort of limits me as to what I can do. But the reality is, God has given me a gift of singing for Him and leading worship. And I feel like that's my way of helping people. And I'm grateful for that. I have so much joy and so much anticipation because I know that the first face I'm ever going to see is Jesus. And that means the world to me. Boys and girls, that girl, I don't even know her name, but she can see what a lot of other people who have sight cannot see. She sees the importance of having the Lord in her life as her guide. And she knows that one day she will see the face of Jesus. And I thought about that. And I thought, why can't more people see that? Well, one answer I didn't read out to the question, what is eyes but cannot see, was an answer that Lucy Laffin gave to me. And a very perceptive answer. She said, a sinner. A sinner has eyes but cannot see. A sinner has eyes, but those eyes cannot see that Christ is the most important person to have in their life. 
And that is because sin blinds us from him. Sin is like a heavy, dark cloud that blocks out the light and the warmth of the sun. And the Bible says that we are all born that way. We're like little kittens, actually, who are born not being able to see. We as human beings are born in sin, not knowing God. We have eyes, but we cannot see. But the good news is, is that when someone comes to Christ and asks to be forgiven of their sin, that cloud is taken away. And for the first time, they are able to experience the wonderful love of God. And then, just like a blind person being able to see, their life is different. So boys and girls, even though that girl doesn't have natural sight, she sees clearly spiritually. Her eyes have been opened to see God's salvation through Jesus. And you know, it's just, it's just better to have no sight and see him than to have full sight and never see him at all. So boys and girls and older people watching this, if you've never come to Christ and had your sins forgiven, then the Bible says you're in darkness. But if you do come to him in prayer, asking him to remove that sin and then begin to walk in the light, your eyes will be opened. Open to see the value of, the wonder of, the beauty of our precious Lord Jesus Christ. Let me pray with us. Father, we thank you this morning that you sent your Son so that we who are blind could now see so that we who have sin can be forgiven from that sin. Lord, we pray that as this service is being shown, that many people, boys and girls, older people as well, would put their trust in their Saviour and Lord. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to sing our second hymn now. It's Open the Eyes of My Heart. So in our journey with Jesus towards Jerusalem, 
towards the cross in which he died for the sins of the world, we have reached the city of Jericho. That's where Mark brings us to in the final verses of chapter 10 of his gospel. Or rather, I should say, he has brought us to the other side of Jericho because we're not stopping there. The passage actually brings us right through Jericho out the other side. <clears throat> Next stop for Jesus is Jerusalem, some 18 miles southwest of Jericho. But although we don't stop in Jericho, we do pause there a little while on the outskirts of it. And there meet a man, the more I think of his story, the more I like him. His name is Bartimaeus, as we've been telling the children. You recognise him as blind Bartimaeus, the man whom Jesus gave the gift of sight to. So we're going to ask Brian, Brian Appleton, to read the passage for us. And then I want to draw a few thoughts from it. Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. This is God's word. The reading is taken from Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. So they called to the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man replied, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. Brian, <clears throat> you know, in the absence of sight, I've read that the four other four senses of blind people are acutely heightened in order for them to help them navigate daily life. And I guess that makes sense. Hearing would become increasingly important, as would your sense of smell and taste and touch. They would compensate for your, uh, for your lack of sight. But Bartimaeus, though, I think displayed uh, two further heightened senses, sharp awareness, which led to him getting a face-to-face -face audience with Jesus, which led to Jesus, the Son of God, the one at whose word anything becomes possible, saying to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Imagine that. Imagine being before God, whose at word anything is possible, and him saying to you, what do you want me to do for you? So what were those other sharp awarenesses that Bartimaeus possessed? And what might we learn by having them present in our lives? Let me suggest two things that Bartimaeus was aware of who Christ was, who Jesus was, and that he was acutely aware of his own need. Or to put it another way, he was aware of God's ability and he was aware of his own inability. And if you put those two together, a loving, gracious, powerful, compassionate God, a God who loves to meet needs, and a man who relentlessly cries out to God in that need, and miracles happen. So let me take the first first, his awareness of Jesus' identity. I guess that day, the day that Bartimaeus met Jesus, started like any day for him. Waking up, he would have shook the straw from his shabby garment, stretched, got up and, and uh, began making his way through Jericho to the gate of Jericho, tapping his way along the familiar turns of those streets. And arriving there, he would have take his, taken his place with the other beggars of the city. There was no welfare state in the first century. If you couldn't work, then you'd have to beg to avoid starvation. And as the city came to life, people moving around, traders selling animals around, he too, along with the others, joined in with the bustle of the city, lifting his voice in his beggar's cry for alms to those who would pass by. Now, although he was blind, he would be keenly aware of his environment. Any changes, Bartimaeus would pick them up immediately. And he picked up 
the noise of a large crowd approaching. Maybe it was the excited chatter of those on the outskirts of that crowd as they approached where he was sitting. Something different was going on. Something was happening that day. And maybe he overheard the name Jesus of Nazareth being spoken out excitedly by those around him. Or maybe he reached out and touched the robe of a passerby and said, what's happening? What's going on? And of course that passerby would have said, Jesus of Nazareth is coming this way. And indeed, Jesus of Nazareth was passing that way. Maybe even had gone past at that stage. He was in the company of his 12 disciples, other followers as well, and many others who had tagged along or were just making their way like Jesus and his entourage to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And at the mention of Jesus' name, Bartimaeus' ears pricked up. And his heart began to race because he knew that name. Not just as a well-known name around the country, but he knew who Jesus was. He knew it theologically, if you like. That this figure who was passing by him was the Messiah of Israel. He was the long-awaited promised one, the one whom the prophets foretold would come. The son of David. The son of David is a clear messianic title and this is the only place actually in Mark where the son of David, that phrase where Jesus is called the son of David. So in a split second Bartimaeus processed the information and knew exactly what to do and he needed to act fast because Jesus would soon be gone. He and his entourage would move on. Soon he'd be out of earshot and his opportunity would be lost. So sitting where he was he began to cry out. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And you know what? Bartimaeus began to shout louder and louder, persistently, despite the shushish and be quiets of all those around him, reveals so much about what he knew about Jesus. Firstly, it revealed that his hope lay in the expectation that the Messiah would come. That's who Jews were waiting on. Uh, and secondly, uh, based on what he'd heard about Jesus, the miracles, the teachings and so on, he concluded that Jesus was that Messiah. And thirdly, from what he just called out to Jesus, we know that he knew that this Messiah was a merciful figure. This was the one who could have mercy upon him. This was the one who could heal him. So his knowledge of Jesus was quite profound, really. Uh, Deeper than any of the religious leaders in the country, more, I suspect, than many of the crowd keeping Jesus company. His awareness of who Jesus was was sharp. It was heightened. That's where he placed his faith. That's who he unashamedly clamoured to get attention from. And I guess we have to commend him for that. You know, he totally got it right. Although Bartimaeus was blind, he could see more than most with full sight. Later in the passage, you know, Bartimaeus is commended for his faith. And true faith is built upon true knowledge of God, who he is, what he's done, how he acts. So Bartimaeus knew, he had true knowledge of of, of who Jesus was. So what could we learn from Bartimaeus in this first point? Well, I think just this. Making the connection that Jesus is God and as God, he can meet our deepest needs is of critical importance in life. Because people who don't make that connection, who hear the name of Jesus and shrug it off, as it were, well, they tend to search to have their needs met in all the wrong places in all the wrong things. And that inevitably only leads to disappointment and frustration. There was just no one else in that crowd who passed by that day who could have done for Bartimaeus what Jesus did. Only Jesus has the ability to do what he does. So let me ask the question to us. How do you see Jesus? 
when you hear his name. Bartimaeus couldn't see it all, but yet he saw that Jesus, who he was. If Jesus' name is mentioned to you, if you were in Bartimaeus' place that day, blind, inquiring what all the fuss was about, and you heard that Jesus was passing by, how would you have reacted? Would you have reacted with a, a blank stare? A shrug, of, a shrug of indifference? Like, so what? That's for Jesus is, is for all the people, it's not for me. Or would your heart have raced? Would you have got excited? Would you have seen an encounter with him as being life-changing? Let's put it in a contemporary context. Someone invites you to a church meeting, gospel mission, or they begin to talk to you about God. How do you react then? Is it with curiosity? Is it with a sense of excitement and awareness? You've heard how others' lives have been blessed and you want that for yourself. Or is it with a weary tolerance? You've heard that sort of thing all before and it just washes over your head. I'm glad that floats your boat, but well, it's just not for me. Or perhaps you hear with outright hostility, how dare you preach to me? How dare you mention that name to me? So how we've reacted in the past or how we currently act, react is probably a good indicator of how you might have responded were you in Bartimaeus' position. It was faith that put Bartimaeus before Jesus then. And it is faith that puts us before Jesus today. It was a heart that remains hopeful, that received the true knowledge of who Jesus is, that informed the faith that created the cry that put him before Jesus. Bartimaeus was blind, but he could see. Can you see? Someone once bluntly asked the deaf and blind Helen Keller, isn't it just terrible to be blind? To which she responded, better to be blind than see with your heart than to have two good eyes and see nothing. So Bartimaeus was very aware of who Jesus was and his awareness served him well. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I would like to say this morning is that Bartimaeus was acutely aware of his own need. He was aware of who Jesus was, but he was also aware of his own need, and that too served him well. You see, he knew, you may think this is obvious, he knew that he was blind, and he knew he didn't want to remain blind. You might say, Seamus, that's obvious. Well, you would think so. But I've discovered that people get accustomed to living with less even blind people. They don't always necessarily want to be fixed, to be changed. I watched a video this week where blind people were interviewed and were asked if they wished they could see. Surprisingly, it wasn't really high on their list. Blindness had just become part of their identity. It was, it was who they were and seeing would change that identity and that was something they thought they would struggle with. One man said, I'm not sure a perfect vision would be a benefit to me. It might be such a shock to have to relearn the world that I might just shut my eyes and go back to the way I was. And for some, they said in that video, seeing would just threaten the sense of community they had with their blind friends, so they just wanted to remain blind. And I've known others with long-term conditions who've become so accustomed to their way of life that anything, even even the good news of the gospel that promises to bring forgiveness and freedom and blessing is just rejected because it's the fear of change that promises to bring them out of that. They're just afraid of what change it might bring. So Bartimaeus' pitiful cry to Jesus, have mercy on me, came from a profound clarity of self-understanding. He was unhappy with who he was and the way his life was. He wanted change. 
and where there is a deep cry for change in your life. And that deep cry is directed towards the Son of God who can change your life. Then change is possible. A life can be lifted from the mud and the mire as we read earlier and set upon a solid rock. What can we learn from the second point? Just this, I think. To have Jesus, we must want Jesus. To have his forgiveness, his acceptance, his salvation, we must want those things. And he's able to give them, more than able to give, the book of Ephesians says, more than we can ask or think according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. God is always willing to see it. He's not willing that any should perish. So Bartimaeus got Jesus' attention. The Lord stopped. He turned to him and said, bring him here. And the calls from the people around for him to shut up were changed to cheer up. He's calling you. Throwing off his cloak, getting to his feet, he was led to Jesus. And then here's that question. What do you want me to do for you? What a question. I have thought about that question all week. What a question. What if it were put to you from the one who can give you anything that's of unbelievable value? And you start in life. Who can wipe out the mistakes. Who could take away the recriminations of the past. From the one who can heal your brokenness, repair your family. Who could redefine even the very purpose of your life. What would you ask him for? What is it that you want out of life? Perhaps you've never really even thought about that. You've never really even thought about asking God for that. Well, you should, because he is able to grant those requests. Jesus wants you, he wants you and I, to come to him with an open heart, persistently, passionately, and he will respond kindly and graciously. Perhaps you tell me it's too late for me to ask such a question. I've lived my life, I've made my mistakes, and there's no way back for me. Well, that's not true. That wasn't true for the thief on the cross who minutes from his death received the promise he'd spend eternity with God in glory. You can read that story in Luke chapter 23. It's never too late. What do you want me to do for you? Well, without hesitation, the blind sightless Bartimaeus said, Rabbi, I want to see and he was granted his request. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you, and immediately he received his sight. And for the rest of Bartimaeus' life, he would wake each morning and take in the scenery around him. He would greet people, now able to recognize them from a distance before they even said a word. He would see everything And he would see much more because the first sight he saw was the face of Jesus. Just like that young girl looked forward to the day when the first person she would see would be Jesus' face. What a thought that is for each of us who've had our spiritual eyes already opened. Because right now we cannot see him, but one day we will face to face. As the hymn says, what a day that will be when my Jesus I will see. I will look upon his face and see the one who saved me by his grace. And you know the true joy of the story is that Bartimaeus not only saw Jesus, but he began to follow him from then on. Verse 52 tells us that immediately he received the sight and began to follow Jesus along the road. Scholars would tell us that this man became a stalwart of the Jerusalem church. His spiritual eyes were opened as well as his physical ones. 
Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Jesus, passing through Jerusalem, passing through Jericho, never to come back that way again. A blind man hears of him, recognises that this is his opportunity to meet with the Messiah, the one who can give him his sight. And he takes that opportunity. He refuses to be put off. And he cries aloud to meet with the Saviour. He receives his sight and more eternal life. Folks, perhaps Jesus of Nazareth is passing by some of us today. Perhaps for some of us today, this is our opportunity. And you may or may not have another chance. You should take that opportunity. You should reach out to him, to the one who asks you the question, what do you want me to do for you? What would you answer that question if it were asked you today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this wonderful story of redemption. This story where this needy man reached out to an almighty God, recognising his moment, recognising who you were, and found mercy when he asked for it. And, O oh God, may each of us find mercy as we look beyond ourselves and look to God and cry out to him. Father, I pray you'd bless these words as they go out, uh, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Right after the benediction, we'll sing the hymn, Light of the World, You Step Down Into Darkness. But right now we're going to say the benediction. Lord, we ask that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would be with us all evermore. Amen.